Hello, everyone. Um, I don't have a choice to give my presentation in French or English. It has to be in English because uh, my French is nowhere near good enough to uh, talk about this topic. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, telling you all a little bit about the, the global sanitation crisis. Um, I think I'm one of the only speakers covering this topic, so I thought it was good to give a bit of background, although Joao uh, did start to talk about that earlier, and I'm really grateful to him for that introduction. Um, and I believe a picture tells a thousand words, so I'm going to tell you about sanitation mostly through, uh, through pictures. Um, I'm then going to uh, tell you a little bit about a technology that uh, we at Cranfield University have developed, and I have a short video, and then I'll uh, talk you through a little bit more detail on the technology. So that's uh, the plan for my presentation. Um, so just to give you an idea of the scale of the sanitation crisis, so this is uh, a map of the world showing uh, countries access to uh, sanitation in their urban areas. Um, and what I particularly want you to focus on is the countries uh, shown in uh, red, uh, which are the countries where less than 50% of the population in urban areas have access to improved sanitation. And improved sanitation can just be a simple pit latrine. So um, the, you can see that uh, most of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Nepal, and I think that's uh, Peru, uh, in Peru or Bolivia, I can't remember which, in South America. Um, so you can see that, um, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, it really is uh, a crisis where so many people do not have access to uh, improved sanitation. So uh, what does that mean? Well, if people don't have access to improved sanitation, maybe this is their only solution, which is open defecation. So people go out, uh, outside in the early morning or in the late evening, to go to the toilet, uh, which is not only undignified and uh, presents risks especially to women, uh, but is, uh, is unsafe for everyone because it means that uh, feces are left around where children are playing and causes a health hazard. So maybe if they're not using uh, open defecation, maybe they have a very simple latrine. So this example here. Uh, the, the pile of tires is the latrine, so the idea is that you sit on top of the tires and do your business. But you can see the water is leaking out of the latrine. Uh, it's really not a very uh, sanitary environment. So lots of people don't even have access to uh, sanitation in their own home and rely on communal facilities. Uh, so this is an example uh, from Kumasi in Ghana. Uh, and you can see it's a, a public toilet block, ladies on the right, men on the left. Now the problem with communal facilities, and maybe you have a similar experience where you work, you might have a communal kitchen, and eventually all the cups build up and they get very nasty. Well, the same thing happens in a communal facility that no one takes responsibility for the cleaning, and you can end up with a scenario like that where it's really not that nice, not a pleasant place to go to the toilet, but this is the only option for millions of people. So maybe uh, you do have a good sanitation option. You, you've built uh, a pit latrine in your house, a nice clean pit latrine like this. You can see it's clean, it's well swept. Uh, it's be a nice place to go to the toilet. But what happens when it gets full? Well, if you live in a rural area when the pit latrine is full, you can cover it up, um, move it, dig another pit a few meters away, move the, the superstructure, the hut that's on top, and you have a new pit latrine. In an urban area where space is much more at a premium, you might not have anywhere to move the pit latrine to. And in this scenario, you need to get it emptied. So this is a pit latrine being emptied in, uh, in Zambia. And in, uh, what this team here have done is that they, the pit latrine is the building on the right. They've dug a hole next to the pit latrine, dug a, uh, a hole, knocked a hole through into the pit, and they're shoveling out the, uh, the waste into the, uh, into the barrel. So I'd say this is a, a kind of a medium example of pit latrine emptying. You can see the people that are doing the emptying have some, um, some protective equipment. They're wearing uh, gloves. They've got uh, Wellington boots on, and they've got masks. 
but they're not really doing a very tidy job of, of shoveling it out. And you can see there's quite a lot of spillage. Um, really quite a lot of spillage. So this is someone's backyard, and this is the, the reality that they've got uh, fecal sludge uh, pathogens all over their, their yard, where their children will be playing later. And even once you've emptied the pit latrine and taken uh, the waste away, well, what happens next? You need somewhere to dispose of it. And uh, there, are not, there are many cities in the world where there is no place for the disposal of uh, fecal sludge, the disposal of waste from pit latrines. So much of it is dumped illegally uh, and then re-enters the environment, potentially, re uh, potentially the drinking water that people are using. So I hope I've illustrated, probably maybe more graphically than you'd have wanted, uh, why uh, sanitation is such a challenge, uh, particularly in urban areas. Uh, so in response to this, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation issued a challenge to reinvent the toilet. And this is what, this is what they wanted. They wanted teams to work together to invent a, a new toilet that met the following criteria. So it had to remove the germs from human waste, um, but also recover valuable resources such as energy, clean water and nutrients, exactly like Joao was expressing earlier today. The toilet had to operate off the grid without any connections to water or sewage or electricity lines. We've heard a lot about, we've been speaking already in this session about costs and affordability. Um, and uh, Gates also said that the toilet had to cost less than five cents per user per day. The toilet had to promote sustainable and financially profitable sanitation services and businesses that could operate in these settings. And the toilet had to be aspirational, uh, a next generation product that everyone would want to use. So at Cranfield University, we saw this challenge and we decided to respond. And we were successful in getting funding uh, from the Gates Foundation to develop our toilets. Uh, we call it the nano membrane toilet. We've been... Uh, just reached the end of our first phase of funding, so we've been working on the toilet for about a year. It's still pretty early stage, but um, I have a video, um, which I hope the, the team can bring up, telling you about our, the toilet and what we've achieved over the first year. Can we have some sound as well? I want our own toilet in the house, I told my mama. Don't be silly, she said. We don't have running water or a sewer. How are we going to have our own indoor toilet? Then one day, a nice man visited in a truck. It was full to the top with shiny new toilets. Being the toilet man is a job that brings happiness to my customers and one that makes me a living. I have a contract to sell and service the toilets. It's an idea that came from some scientists in England. We have designed a household scale sit down toilet that families will aspire to have in their homes. Crucially, the odour is controlled in the toilet. It's true, it really doesn't smell, which is great, as we keep it in the house. Why isn't it smelly? Well, it's a toilet bowl with a rotating ceiling flush. Once the user has finished and closes the lid, it forces the drum to rotate through 270 degrees, keeping a constant smell barrier. The waste then empties into the holding chamber below without the need for water or power. At the three-quarter turn point, a scraper wipes the drum clean. It's a true flush-and-forget mechanism. The waste is now in the holding tank. The solids collect at the bottom, while the liquid floats on top. Pure water in vapour form, without any pathogens, then passes into the membrane bundles, where it's driven along by a sweep gas. The vapour then enters the large columns at the back of the toilet, which contain nano-coated hydrophilic beads. As the vapour passes over the beads, it condenses. The pathogen-free water then drips down a collection pipe and drains into a water tank, which doubles as a step at the front of the toilet. This water is very handy. We use it for cleaning and for watering our plants. The dewatered sludge, which is collected at the bottom of the angled tank, is carried away by an Archimedes screw. The screw lifts the solid waste to the top of a misting chamber, a tunnel that drops at 90 degrees. As the waste falls and lands, it is coated by a paraffin wax that stops the pathogens and odours from escaping 
while letting the solid waste dry out. Every week, the man comes to empty our toilet. I remove the waste bag and take it with others to the thermal processing plant. They pay me regularly for this service, and I deliver batteries if needed to power the toilet. There is a reliable off-grid power source for the toilet also, human power. If the battery is low, my brother charges it by riding the bicycle, or I use a special hand crank. Easy. Under my contract, I service each toilet every six months. I replace the spray, take the membranes away for regeneration, and put in new sets. I can also produce a fertilizer to sell by recovering the nitrogen-based nutrients collected on the toilet bead module, which I remove during the service. This extra income means I charge my customers under 5 US cents per user per day. Which are pennies well spent, as this one toilet has changed the lives and improved the health of my whole family. The difference one toilet can make. So, um, hopefully that video has shown you a little bit of our vision of what we're, where we're going. We are still at a fairly early stage, so uh, it is a vision at present. Um, but let me talk you through some of the, the details of the, the technology, because I think some of that will interest this audience. So, uh, the first uh, technology we developed is the flush mechanism. Um, because, as the video said, we wanted something that was going to separate the user both from the sight and the smell of the waste. So we developed this, uh, this rotating flush with a scraper, both of which are activated as the user closes the lid of the toilet. Um, then uh, the waste passes into the holding chamber, and the holding chamber contains the membrane bundles. So um, this is what the membrane bum bundles look like in real life. So they're hollow fiber membranes, so they're basically like straws. Uh, you put a, a sweep gas or vacuum pressure through the middle of the, membra the membranes and uh, water can pass through the membranes. Uh, water is actually the smallest molecule in uh, wastewater. So um, the membranes have very small holes or no holes at all uh, to pass the membrane to, so that the wa only the water can pass out of the waste. Let me explain what I mean uh, bit more about the membranes. So we're trialing two membranes. Uh, one is a microporous membrane. Um, and you, again, this uh, diagram shows just the water molecules uh, passing through the, uh, the membrane walls. Uh, we're also experimenting with dense membranes. So this is what I mean by a membrane that has no holes in it at all. Um, and this relies on the water molecules going through the uh, the actual uh, lattice structure of the, the membrane wall uh, and being taken away. And because that water is, uh, is pure, uh, literally just water, maybe a bit of ammonia going through in the microporous membranes, no pathogens at all, that water is then safe to drink, uh, although that might be a step too far for most people, but certainly safe to use for washing, for irrigation. So the water... Uh, passes through the membranes as a vapor and then needs to be recondensed. Uh, so uh, we have these bead columns. Uh, and the beads are, bead columns are actually inspired by this guy. This is the, the Namib desert beetle. Um, and you can see maybe on his back, he has uh, little humps. Now the humps are hydrophilic, uh, so they attract water. Um, and the, uh, the, in between the humps, the little humps, the, uh, it's hydrophobic. So what happens is the water is attracted to the humps and then uh, drains down them onto the uh, hydroph uh, hydrophobic surface where it forms beads and then the whole structure is such that the water drains uh, into the mouth of the, the desert beetle and it can live in really dry environments. So we took inspiration from this for our bead columns which have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic beads so that they efficiently condense the water and make it available for use. Uh, the solid waste has to be transported away from the, uh, from the holding chamber. Um, so we've developed this uh, screw press which uh, removes the waste from the chamber. 
This was actually a bit we didn't really think about when we first put the idea together, so it was quite a challenging bit to, to design near the end of the project. Now the solids, uh, we're looking at various ideas for how to deal with the solids, but one idea is to uh, extract energy from them. Um, where uh, Gates are very encouraging of collaboration between the teams, so we've been looking at working uh, with two of the other teams who are also responding to this challenge. One is uh, Janaki Industries, uh, who've developed a, uh, a simple process to dry and then combust the solids. And then also Unilever, who've developed the pyrolysis unit, you can see on the bottom right of the slide, um, which is another option uh, to pyrolyze uh, the solid waste once it's been dewatered. Um, our system does need a little bit of power, so we developed uh, two different uh, options to power it. The first is a hand crank, uh, which you can see uh, on that photo uh, there. And the second is a, a bicycle generator, uh, which uh, can generate power uh, for the toilet. Now, you'll recall that the condition uh, was that it had to be an aspirational toilet, so it was a, a real pleasure in this project to work with our design colleagues at Cranfield University. And uh, this is the toilet that they designed for us, um, which we think is a real, uh, a really aspirational product that people will really want to have in their houses. Um, but of course, it was critical that all these components fitted into this toilet. Uh, so um, you can see how it, everything fits together in this image here. So uh, you can see uh, the dewatering membranes are, are in orange, the screw in pink, uh, the flush mechanism, the bead columns uh, at the back of the toilet, and the clean water reservoir at the front where the water is uh, collected. So that is everything I have to tell you um, about the toilet, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. If you want to uh, visit our website, uh, we've got some more details, some things to download, a regular blog about, uh, about the progress of the toilet, and of course you're welcome to contact me as well.